Bibles and we'll turn to Galatians, Galatians chapter 6, Galatians chapter 6. All right. You know, we hear so many, so many preachers, so many people falling away from church, getting themselves caught up in situations that they should not even been in. And most of the time that I've seen, people don't try to do what the Bible says here, restore such a one. Right, to restore. You know, does that mean that we're going to, um, actually let's pray, I'm going to start preaching. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I love you and I praise you. Father, I just ask you now to guide and direct Lord, speak through me tonight. Lord, help me to say exactly what you want to say. I ask you to anoint my lips and with your spirit, to fill each and every single listener with your spirit, that they may glean something from your word. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. But anyway, it says in verse 1 of Galatians chapter 6, it says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, and lest also be tempted. See, we forget, again we forget, the title of this is, It Will Be all right. It will be all right. Doing surgery. Excuse me for a second. You know, there comes a point where too many times we we don't do the right hand of too many times when someone gets caught in something or they fall into sin, or it looks like they fall into, they fell into sin, but they pull away from the church. We which are spiritual, or we which are here at the church, that are still doing the things that God has asked us to do, we need to go and talk to them. We need to go and restore them, lift them up. You know, how many times have we done something wrong and we felt horrible about it? Horrible. To the point where, well, I, I don't even know if I would need to go around them anymore. They're, you know, they know what I did. But lots of times, people don't they don't restore, they're always tearing down. They're always, oh, don't go around him because he's done this, this, and this. You, you, you don't want to do that because he will bring you down with them. Instead of saying, hey, I'm praying for you, why don't we go have a cup of coffee? Well, what, what about the how about if you come and have a cup of coffee at the house? I want to talk to you. And maybe the only thing they're, they're waiting for is to someone to show them how to come back to the fold. Think about this. We've seen so many people leave the church that still love God, but they don't know how to come back. They don't know how to get that forgiveness from other people. Well, if I, if I say sorry and I do it again, um, what are they going to think? I've heard these excuses. Well, the Bible says, forsake not the sending of yourself together. 
So we need to go and bring them back and restore them. Now, now does that mean that they get all the trust back that they, they've had before? No. They have to earn that back. Does that mean that, what, let's just say, one of us fell, and you come back and you ask the church to forgive you, and the church says yes. Does that mean that we will not love on you? No, that's not what it's talking about. We will love on you, but there's a process that has to happen, is what they're talking about here. Restore. It isn't bringing them back to doing everything that they've done in the past, no. It is showing them, listen, there's still penalties for what you've done. There's consequences for actions. But restoring them and allowing them to get all the trust back. That's what it's about. Right there. Restoring them to the fellowship. Whose fellowship? Our fellowship? The fellowship of God. Number one. And number two, restoring them to the fellowship of the church. That's what it's about. Restoring. Point number one, we all can fall into sin. We all can fall into sin. It says, unless thou also be tempted. See, we've got to remember what, what, what it really is saying is don't get a big head and point your fingers at someone else because you can fall too. You can't look at a preacher and say, look what he has done. I can't believe this. Man, I would never. I'm going to fall. Once I say I will never do what he's done, I'm going to do worse than what he's done. See, we've got, we, we, can't, we can't be always blaming or always putting down because we're going to get that way too. Oh, my button, thank you. My, you know, the, my, my children's going, showing me, hey, it's not mine. But anyway, <laughs> restore such one on your knees, help. <laughs> I think they got it. Yeah, I know. I got it. Thank you for restoring such a one. No. <laughs> Restore me, making sure that all is all proper. Okay, let's go on. Now, considering yourself. See, if we're not careful, we can fall. If we don't do the proper things to keep ourselves from falling, that would just be like if I had a drinking problem. I'm not going to go, go into a bar and sit there and order a Coke and hoping I don't drink another drink. No, that's just putting yourself into a situation that you don't want to be in. That's just like if I was smoking a cigarette and I just quit. I'm not going to go to a house that I know is smoking cigarettes. That's not going to happen. <clears throat> Why? Because you're putting yourself into temptation. Or drugs. Or, or whatever the temptation may be. See, we've got to make sure that we're spiritual. Or in right with God so we don't fall so we don't go into sin because it says if he spiritual or if you're right with God restore this one that isn't or help this one that isn't to bring him back point number two I believe I'm on Yes. We need to help people. Let's look at it. Verse 2. Bear ye one another's burdens 
and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bear ye one another's burdens, so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, does that mean that that one of us might have back payments on a house? Does that mean that I take over your payments, Billy, and they become my payments? No, it's not talking that way. It isn't talking about, oh, with me taking Billy's burden and putting it on me and carrying it so Billy doesn't have to because I got more money than Billy does. So what? Probably not, but anyway. <laughs> but you, you see what I'm saying? When it says, I almost misquoted it, so. When it says, bear ye one another's burdens, it, it isn't talking about taking the burden over. It's talking about helping them, relieving by talking to them and giving them a plan, a game plan that they can work. Or back then, it was a pile of sticks or whatever that was strapped to their back. You put it on your back to give him a, a breather. That's bearing the burden, but it's not carrying it all the time for them. You know, we can bear each other's burdens. I can sit there and talk to Rick about something that's bothering me. And Rick can give me advice on how to take care of it. Or vice versa. Anybody. That's what it's talking about. Listening and helping any way that we can, except for taking it and carrying it for them <coughs> a long distance. It's just enough to give them the, the extra boost they need to carry it all the way because it's theirs. How do we know that we're not supposed to carry other people's burdens? Point number three. We cannot take away people's burdens. We cannot take them away. Let's look at it. Verse five. Every man shall bear his own burden. But Bridget, you just said that it is bear, bear one another's burdens. As I've just been saying, we can't take them away. We can, we can offer help and try to help ease the burden. Like one of our church members, we, we help a little bit financially with them. They didn't ask for it. We helped just a little bit. And we've only done it once. You see what I'm saying? We eased the burden. But it was there, it's still their burden to carry and to take care of the situation. To, to do what it is necessary to do. Think about it. I have a house painting. I'm not asking anybody to take care of that burden. I'm not. My wife and I have to take care of that burden. We have a car on one of the cars. I'm not asking anybody to take care of that burden. That's our burden. That's something that we have put upon our backs. Have you ever noticed, Brother Hudson, most of the time when someone's carrying a burden, they put it there themselves by doing something stupid? I know I don't like the word stupid, but not smart, ignorant, unwise. Uh, that's what I'm looking for. Unwise. Unwise. Thank you. And 
most of the time, if we would just stop and think, those burdens on our back would fall off. You know, Melissa and I, we've been trying for the last several years to pay off all of our credit card debt. You know something? We did. We did. Amen. Slowly but surely, we did. We have one credit card, and that's for the cars. Matter of fact, it's got some tires and stuff on it right now. So actually, we have one credit card that we're, you know, paying off. But see, I don't want to take another credit card and put that burden upon my back and have that issue with not being able to pay it off or slow, slow and paying it off. I don't want that. But that's not the burden that's going to go on my back. Let's just say, buy a car. Jacob's looking, Jacob eventually is going to need a new car. A newer car or a better running car. You know, he could go into debt and buy a brand new car. Matter of fact, he sat right back there today and says, he says, I wish I could buy a brand new car. You know what I told him? Don't look at me to go sign for you. Didn't I? Why? Because that's not a burden that I'm willing to put upon my back. That's not something that I need to worry about. Is he going to be paying this car note? If not, it's falling on my shoulders. No. I don't think so. See, we put the burdens on our own back. Most of the time. And most of the time, the burdens that we're putting on our backs are just things that we're thinking of. And, and, and worrying about things that haven't even happened yet. You know why? Men do that more than women? Because we analyze everything. We think of what if this, what if this, and if this happens and this, and then Eventually, we get put on our back and we start really worrying about it. And then we have to say, why are you worried about this? It hasn't even happened yet and you're worried about it. Give it to God and let God deal with it. And most of the time, we give it to God. But then we take it right back again. I don't understand it. But we do, don't we? So we got to give it to God and then walk away from it. That's one last thing that we have to carry on our backs. We have a lot to carry on our backs. We got electric bills, we've got car car bills, we've got insurance on those things, and, and food that we gotta put on the table, clothes that we gotta make sure that our kids have, shoes to make sure the kids have. You know, it seems like Jordan's always going out of shoes or something. And, and it's like, we just got your shoes. But those are burdens that are necessary. I'm talking about the burdens that are not. Let's live frugal and we won't have to worry about burdens and financial. Point number four. I know I was there for a while. But point number four. God is not mocked. Amen. Verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whosoever a man sow, for excuse me, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall be reaped. I want to just look at the first part of this. Mocked or made fun of, ridiculed. God is being ridiculed now. But the Bible says God is not mocked. But they're going to get their just resort, the reserve, res, resorts, resorts. Yeah, their resorts. Yeah, there's a resort, sir, for them. 
Not a very good one, but you know what I'm saying. Just like there was, there's a TV show that's been out there for years. And if I said it, most of us would know what it was. Several years ago, I put, made a boxing ring. Christ in one quarter, the devil in the other, and they're going to have a boxing match. And in that show, the devil got a good couple blows on, on Jesus. See, that's mocking Christ. Right. That is mocking Christ. You know something, Billy? My wife, because J.C. Penney's was one of the sponsors, Melissa found out about it. She put on there, listen, I take offense to someone making fun of my God. And she got slammed for it. God is not mocked. This was several years ago, but if J.C. Penney says, see, God is not mocked. God is, God is not going to stand for it. You know, they can make fun of me all they want. But once they start making fun of the God that I serve, the only God that I serve, the only true God that I serve, watch out. She bears are coming. They really are. Because even when they're making fun of me, they're really not making fun of me. They're making fun of God. See, God will take care of his own. God will take care of everything. Point number five. You sow what you reap what you sow. This is the, the, the next part of this verse. If, if you're going to sow anger, you're going to reap anger. What do I mean? If you're sowing nothing but anger towards people, people are going to show you the same thing that you're showing them. Matthew 7, 12. You know, I did, I, if not, put the golden rules in Matthew 7, 12. My mom used to tell me all the time, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's a good philosophy. I thought she was the smartest, at that time, the smartest person in the world for telling me that. And then I read it in the Bible, I was like, oh, I know where she got that from. Yeah. But if you want to be treated a certain way, treat other people that way. If you want people to pray for you, you pray for them. You know, at, at the children's home, I used to tell the, um, the kids this. If you want someone to change the way that they're treating you, change the way that you treat them. <laughs> Point in case. Miss Gale will Paul, the Hudson's son, Melissa's brother, had a bully in one of their schools. Miss Gale tells him. Find out what he likes and get it and put it on his desk. He did it. They became best friends. Why? Because Paul changed the way that he was treating them. See, you sow what you reap. You reap, excuse me, you reap what you sow. I said it backwards. You reap what you sow. And if you, and, and it even goes in in verse. It talks about where I'm sowing in the flesh, you're going to reap in the flesh. You sow in the spirit, you're going to reap in the spirit. Where do we, you know, do we do reap some stuff spiritually down here on earth. We really do. When we lead someone to Christ, or we're reaping spiritual. But most of it's stored for us in heaven. See, think about this, people. I don't want people to look and say, oh, there's Joe. He says he's a pastor. <coughs> he's doing the same stuff we are. 
Have you ever noted? I can say certain things about a certain religion that they allow their preachers to drink and make wine and make beer. Most of y'all know who I'm talking about. They do it inside the church for communions. See, automatically you know who I'm talking about. They still what they do. A lot of their the clergymen are alcoholics. A lot of them are other things. They they sow what they reap. Excuse me. They reap what they sow. I'm saying it backwards all night. They reap what they sow. First, yes. They reap what they sow. And and. If you're going to sow, you better watch out what you're sowing. Melissa Dunn Garden, or what a raised garden, I guess that's what they call it, a raised garden. And you know something? She sowed banana peppers. You know, she didn't get an orange. She got a banana pepper. She sowed tomato plants, tomato seeds. You know, she didn't, she, she's not getting a watermelon. She's getting a tomato. When you sow good to someone, or you could say it this way, what comes around goes around. What do I mean? Is if you're being ugly to people, people are going to be ugly to you. If you're nice to them, they're going, people are going to be nice to you. That's what it's all about. So many of you. And last point, and then I'm done. We can't lose our focus on God. We can't lose our focus on God. Let's look at verse 9. Let us not be weary in well doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. You know, it's so easy as Christians to lose our focus on God. It really is. We can all go through the motions and act like we're such spiritual people, but deep down inside, we're so far away from God, it isn't funny. We've seen them. We've seen the people come in and praise God, hallelujah, and all this other stuff. When you're talking to them, they know the language, they, they know how to talk to to us, and but as soon as they get outside, get down the road, it all comes out. But when they're in here, we see that they look so close, close to God, but they're not. But what about the ones that are doing everything that God has asked them to do? And it seems like Nothing's happening. It seems like you've been praying and praying and praying and praying for visitors. And they're only trickling in. And then you know the church right down the road in Tillman's Corner that they are growing leaps and bounds. Why is that? Because their reaping time is now. It says in due season. Not our season. In due season when God says it's time. 
we shall reap if we faint not. See, we can't pull away from what God is telling us to do. Does that mean that we might have to put a little bit more upon our, our plates if God tells us to do this? It does. Does that mean that, that we don't see nothing happening? No one's coming in. It's only us 20 and no more. What's going on? Okay, I'm done. I'm done. Forget it, I'm done. You know what that tells me? The blessings are right around the corner. But that's when the blessings come right around the corner. How many of us have heard about two men digging for diamonds? Two men digging for diamonds. One man, he's digging and digging and digging, finds nothing. The other man's digging and digging and he finds one diamond. He digs a little bit further, he finds two. And the, the one man that found nothing was only six inches away from a diamond field that would have gave him billions and billions of dollars but he quit right before he did. See, that's some of us, not us in here, but some of us as Christians, ready before the blessings come, we say, okay, I'm done. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not pastoring anymore. I'm not doing this under school bus anymore. The children are just too unruly. Or, or, I'm not, I'm, I'm done, Pastor. I'm not being a deacon anymore. No one's listening to what we've got to say. <laughs> that happens, doesn't it? Because they start looking at, they're getting weary. They're getting drained. And they're not being refreshing themselves like they should in the Word of God. It all goes back to if you're spiritual. Spiritual. Only way to be spiritual is what? Stay in the Word. Stay in the Word. And do the things that we know that we need to do. Because it isn't, as I said this morning, we will go out and water and plant, but God gets the increase, gives the increase. When? In due season. You can't plant a a tomato plant from seed and go out there tomorrow morning and expect it to be a full blown plant with red tomatoes on it. That, would, that sounds kind of not smart upstairs, unwise. There it is. Unwise, right? How many of us have ever planted a plant before? How many of us have watered it, put the hole, put the seed in, watered it, covered it up? And nothing happened. <laughs> nothing happened. Yeah. Yes. But then we go out there the next day. We look down. Nothing. Do we stop watering? No. Put a little bit more water on it if it needs it. Well, most plants you need know, water a little bit every day. And then you go on your way. You go out there. My two, well, these two right here, I'm so excited. It's because they've been planting, they've been watering, right? And then they go out there, and nothing's happening. They go out there, and nothing's happening. And then Moses says, hey, Joe, guess what? The water on the water on the tomato plant that we planted two weeks ago is finally starting to grow, come out of the ground. We got a little seedling or whatever they want to call it. It's, it, 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 it it's growing. Hey, Joe, guess what? It's, it's six inches long now. And now it's like this. 
And you, you know what they're telling me? We got small tomatoes on our plant. On our plant. Five, see, five. She knows exactly how many there is. Did that take overnight? No. Are they ripe yet? No. Can you pick them? Yeah. Yes, you can. Yeah, I know. Fried green tomatoes. I can't wait to have some. But anyway, can you pick them? Yes. Are they ripe? No. No, they're not. Let's take an apple. You see the blooms on the tree. Those things are about this big. Anybody that's grown up in the north no, without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah, you can go ahead and pick that thing. But your face is going to suck inwards because it's so bitter. You know that you don't want to eat that thing when it's this big. Or, or even when it's full size and it's not red yet. There's some yellow and green apples, I know. But you don't eat those until they turn red. Why? Because that's when they're sweet. But it's all in due season. We have a time coming where we're going to grow leaps and bounds in due season. It isn't, I'm not saying it isn't our time to grow because I can't say that that's God's job. But we've got to do the God has asked us to do is to watch what we're sowing, restore the ones that have fallen, carry one another's burdens, bear, it doesn't say carry, it says bear, there's a difference. Bear one another's burdens. And God will give the increase. God, in due season, we shall do. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I love you and I praise you. And Lord, I just ask you now to guide and direct as the musicians come. And I just pray if someone needs to do business with you that they get settled even before they walk out the doors this evening. In Jesus' name, amen.